let's turn to John 8. Uh, we are in the second half of John 8. Uh, we had learned uh, about uh, how the adulterous woman was so forgiven. And that, that was, remember, in the middle of Jesus standing in the temple, in the tabernacle, and teaching the scriptures. And then the accusers brought her right before him and interrupted everything. And then he went right back to teaching. And remember what he said then? He said, I am what? The light of the world. I am the light of the world. Nobody's going to walk in darkness, right? When you follow me, right? I am the light of the world, right? He said that in verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So let's pick up in read verses 13 through 20 now. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Even if I testify, excuse me, even if I testify about myself, Jesus replied, my testimony is valid because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. And if I do judge, my judgment is true because I'm not alone, but I and the Father who sent me judge together. Even in your law, it is written that the witness of two men is valid. I am the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Then they asked him, where is your father? You know neither me nor my father, Jesus answered. If you knew me, you would also know my father. He spoke these words by the treasury while teaching in the temple complex. But no one seized him. The hour had not yet come. And so... That hour is called God's time, which is what? Cairo's time, right? Right? So his hour had not yet come. So he's teaching, he's walking, he knows that his hour will come, right? But his hour had not yet come. And so he continues uh, to do exactly what the Father is telling him to do. In other words, he's doing the will of the Father. And so the first witness to Jesus is Jesus himself. Right? It's Jesus himself, okay? And so they're telling him, look, at you bear witness of yourself. Well, your witness isn't true. That's not true. So Jesus had just proclaimed that he is what? The light of the world, but the Pharisees couldn't see it. The Pharisees couldn't see his light. You know why? Because they were blind. Because they're, they were blinded. They had veils over their eyes. It's not that there wasn't light. There was light. But they couldn't see it because they were blind, because the light of Jesus failed to shine in them. See, a seen person, right? A seen person doesn't need someone to prove light, correct? Right? Because we're seen, okay? You simply see it. So light establishes its claim. And then seeing people see it. Right? It's the same what Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. We now see it because we're believers. Right? You first believe, then you what? Then you see. Then you see. Okay? Now, the Pharisees couldn't, you know, the religious rulers, the Pharisees, could not prove that Jesus was not the Messiah that he claimed to be. And that drove them nuts. Right? It drove them nuts, okay? They hoped that they could change the argument saying that Jesus couldn't prove that he was Messiah and God and that he didn't have enough witnesses to prove his claim. Notice how they're like coming at him every which way, right? Jesus was his own witness testifying that he was Messiah and God. And if they couldn't kill Jesus's, I should say Jesus the witness, then they were going to intimidate him, right? Then they were going to go after him and intimidate him. And if they couldn't intimidate him, then they did what? They hoped to show that he was unreliable, that he was an untrustworthy witness, okay? So he says, look at, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. And so Jesus would agree that under normal circumstances, a man's testimony regarding himself could not be established as true because they always wanted to. They always wanted to, right? Nevertheless, Jesus pointed out that he was qualified 
to give testimony about himself. So remember, he's, he's still standing. He's still teaching, right? There are many people in the temple. And Jesus can testify about himself because why? Because he's got a view of eternity, eternity past, eternity future, okay? And he says, look, at, I know where I have come from, and I know where I am going to. Where did he come from? Heaven, right? Where is he going to? Heaven, okay? And so <clears throat> Jesus can testify uh, because of that, okay? And he was saying that, that he, not they, he judged righteously. They did not. They did not. He says, look at you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. I judge no one, okay? So in other words, they had brought themselves up as, you know, constituted themselves as judges, and so they were going to judge Jesus, and they decided against him. You're not who you say you are. Because according to the flesh, you were born in Galilee, right? And he says, no, I came from heaven, and I'm going to heaven, right? And so Jesus can testify about himself because his testimony was fully supported by his father, by God the Father, right? He says, my judgment is true. I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. He was always, always doing the will of the Father that sent him. <clears throat> and he says, they said that he must give witness about himself. So no one else is qualified to give witness about his nature and about his essential work except himself, except himself. He says, I am with the Father who sent me. I and my Father are one, okay? And the religious leaders continued to protest. And in the midst of them protesting and trying to, you know, basically humiliate him as well, okay, Jesus was absolutely settled in his identity. He was absolutely settled and secure in his identity. He knew that he was Jesus, the Savior, the Promised One, the Messiah, despite all the voices around him that told him otherwise. And as I was dwelling on this, I thought about us. I thought about us as believers. Because the place of being settled and secure in your identity in Christ is a wonderful pattern for us as believers today. Right? Settled and secure in your identity in Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? Very cleverly disguised as a mom, a nana, a wife, a teacher, a, right? Right? I know who I am. I know who I am in Jesus Christ. And I'm settled in that. And I'm secure in that. And you know what that brings? It brings settled joy and it brings settled peace. No matter what all the other voices say. Because I know that I know that I know that I know. And that's just how Jesus walked through this earth. He knew that he knew that he knew. So then he was the first witness. He said, look, I can witness unto myself. And then in 17 and 18, the second witness he talked about was what? God the Father, God the Father. It's also written in your law, the testimony of two men is true, he tells them. Okay, so Jesus believed that his testimony was enough. Yet to accommodate them, what he did is he brought in another testimony. And who did he bring in? His Father, his Father, right? So, okay, if you're going to demand two witnesses, okay, I got it. Me and my Father, <laughs> and my Father, right? Can you just see him smoking there? right, coming out of their nose and their ears, right? He says, look at, I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So God the Father also testified that Jesus was the Messiah, was the Son of God, God the Son, right? And so he's like, okay, there's, there's two for you. Spurgeon says this, Charles Spurgeon, our Lord speaks here exactly in the character of an ambassador, such a person does not bring a second with him to vouch his truth. His credentials from his king ascertain his character. 
he represents the king's person. So our Lord represents the Father is bearing witness with him. Right? Just like we're an ambassador here, right? And who bears witness with us? Jesus does, right? For what he did on the cross? Absolutely. So Jesus knows his Father, but the religious rulers, the Pharisees, did not. And so they said to him, where is your father? Where is your father? And quite frankly, they did this probably to be very deeply cutting as an insult to Jesus. Because they were referring to the controversy around his virgin birth. Around his virgin birth. And to the rumors of his miraculous conception. But they really thought it was an impure one. So they're going after him. They're going after him. Where's your father? And he looks at him and he says, you know neither me nor my father. So in referring to Jesus' parentage, the Pharisees thought that they had some like dangling, big, scandalous information on him, on Jesus, okay? And they must have thought, let's watch how he reacts when we reveal what we know about him, Right? They're like just waiting for the perfect moment, right? But in response, what does Jesus do? He just makes it clear, you know, you don't know anything about me, and you don't know anything about my father. And he spoke, it says that they, he spoke these words in the treasury. That's in the, the outside courts of the temple where many, 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 many people were listening. And so... John is reminding us that, that Jesus is sharing all this, debating his opponents in a very public place in Jerusalem. So everybody's hearing. Everybody's hearing, which is really a good, good thing, right? It's right on the Temple Mount. And, and still, this is the best thing ever. Still, no one can lay hands on him because it's not his what? It's not his time. Is that so great? It's not his time. Okay, so... Let's read uh, verses 21 through 29 now because Jesus uh, is telling of his coming departures and the religious leaders are insulting him. Let me look this up here, 21 through 29. Then he said to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Who are you, they questioned. Precisely what I've been telling you from the very beginning, Jesus told them. I have many things to say and to judge about you, but the one who sent me is true. And what I have heard from him, these things I tell the world. They did not know he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but just as the Father taught me. I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases Him. Because I always do what pleases Him. So now, He's telling of His coming departure, right? And, and the religious leaders are, are going to insult him. And Jesus is telling him, look, I'm going away. I'm going away. And where I'm going, you cannot come. Right? You, you, got, you have to visually be there, ladies, right? You cannot come. So Jesus knew he was going where? Back to heaven, right? He's going back to heaven. And because of their hatred against him, Jesus could say that his accusers were not going to heaven. Okay, so where he was going, they could not follow. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about us. If we follow Jesus on earth, we will follow him to heaven. Right? Really, really easy, right? Really easy, right? My mom would always say, oh, I'm just practicing here on earth. Right? This is just, this is just, I'm playing uh, an away game here. I know where my, um, my goalposts are. 
right? I mean, how great is that, right? That's, that's very true. And I want to please him here. Like Jesus said, he pleased him all the time. Well, he was perfect because he's God, okay? But I want to please him here, just practicing for pleasing him there, right? That should be your desire as you know Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord, as your Adonai, right? And so if you follow Jesus here on earth, you're going to follow him to heaven. So if we express no desire to follow him on earth, what would make you think that you want to follow him to heaven? You want to escape hell and you have the gold ticket to heaven? That's why I ran up the aisle about 2,000 times when I was a little kid. But I didn't know Jesus. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I just knew I didn't want to go to hell, whatever that was. Not until I was 31. Did I have a relationship with him that I knew that he died for me? And I wanted to walk with him and talk with him and please him and desire uh, to be with him. And so he's saying, look, where I'm going, you can't come. And so they go, well, will he kill himself? Okay, this was another insult against Jesus, okay? The, the Jews, listen carefully, the Jews of Jesus' time taught that the, lower, the lowest levels of Hades, of hell, okay, were for those who committed suicide. And here... The Pharisees, remember the Pharisees added to Scripture. They added rules to Scripture. You know that, right? right? The Sadducees took away from Scripture. The, the Pharisees tried to twist Jesus' words to imply that he will commit suicide, suicide and therefore be damned. And Jesus is talking about two destinies here. See, Jesus will go to glory, to heaven, and on their present course, they will die in their sins. Is that what he wants for them? No. Is that what he wants for anyone? No. no. He wants for all to come to know him. So he tells them, he says, look, you're from beneath, I'm from above, you're from this world, and I am not of this world. And so the Pharisees opposing Jesus implied that he would go to hell as suicide according to their teaching, which is false. Which is false, did you hear me? This is false, okay? And Jesus answered that they did have different destinies, just not as they thought. He says, but look, if you don't believe in me, you're going to die in your sins. If you don't believe in me, you're going to die in your sins. So these men were religious leaders. Are you following me? Okay, that's what I was until I was 31 years old. I was religious. How many of you guys are religious before you knew Jesus, right? Right? I was religious, okay? And these were religious leaders. Yet they lived in darkness that they filled their mind with, and their deeds showed it. Their deeds showed it. And the darkness remained because why? Because they rejected, meaning they did not believe, they rejected light. Remember, he's the light. I am the light, right? And so they rejected light. And so Jesus gave a very serious warning to them. The day of grace is not going to last forever. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. For any of you who don't know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. The day of grace is not going to last forever. Death would make their sinful darkness permanent. And he doesn't want that for anyone. For anyone. See, you and I were born in sin. Amazing. Right? We were born in sin, right? People are born in sin. Psalm 51.5 says, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. So we were all born in sin. And if we hold on to our sin and do not deal with it, we're going to die in our sins, plural. Okay? And so since all sin must be dealt with, those who die in their sins will have to pay for their sins. 
And remember, Jesus already paid for our sins, right? On the cross. And he wants us to accept that gift of salvation, that freedom, that our sins, past, present, future, have been forgiven. And we walk in the freedom of that, okay? But here's the deal. If we have our sins dealt with now, while we're here on earth, on this side of death, by trusting in whom Jesus is and what he did to save us, you will avoid dying in your sins. Right? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you notice, the plural sins is used in verse 24, as I just talked about, as against the singular sin used in verse 21. Sins in verse 24 Singular sin in verse 21, okay? The singular sin expresses the root sin of unbelief. Of unbelief. The plural expresses the particular attitudes, words, and actions that make up its fruit. So the fruit of sin is sins. Are you following me? The fruit of sin is sins. So Jesus says to him, look, if you do not believe that I am he, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, right, then you're going to die in your sins. So Jesus is calling them to believe that I am. I am. Here it is. The title of deity again. I am. Remember he was, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am living water, right? I am. This is a title of deity. And if the Pharisees would be saved from dying in their sins, they must believe, they must believe in Jesus and who he really is, God the Son. It's never changed. Same with us. 2,000 years later, it's never changed, okay? So Jesus tells them of his in uh, excuse me excuse me of his dependence on God the Father of his dependence on God the Father for all he said so then they said to him who are you who are you now you guys that's really a wonderful question from a sincere heart i mean remember they're sort of like i mean they added all this stuff and they were religious and they had you know always done this and they they puff themselves up and now Jesus is just you know putting all kinds of holes in their thinking and and so they go well who, who are you who are you and so this was a sincere heart it was a sincere question and at the same time it comes from a combination of of willful willful confusion and contempt against him because Jesus had told him time and time and time again and they continued to ask always hoping for an answer that they could do what that they could trap him that they could trap him that they could condemn him just like the accusers did with the adulterous woman they wanted to trap Jesus they wanted to condemn him see even now think of this some questions aren't used to discover the truth, right? They're used to resist the truth and justify what you're thinking, right? They're used to justify your refusal to believe. I did it time and time again before I knew Jesus. I'm sure you did too. You would justify, well, this is what I believe. And so... We know that the religious leaders had asked many hostile questions before um, when they asked in verse 19, uh, where's your father? That's a hostile question, right? In verse 22, will he kill himself? That's a hostile question. And now in the verse 25, right, who are you? Who are you, okay? And he, Jesus, I love this, Jesus looks at him, well, let's go back just like I was saying from the beginning, right? Have you, ever, have you ever done that with your kids? Well, let's go over this again. Well, you know, let's go over, let's, let's, go, let's go around 
under, over, right? Let's, let, he goes, well, just as I've been saying to you from the beginning. So he didn't have a new answer for them. They were looking for a new answer. He didn't have a new answer. He would repeat the truths. He would repeat the themes. He spoke to them many times before. And he says, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said about that. I could speedily expose all your iniquities, your pride and ambition, your hypocrisy and irreligion, your hatred to the light, and your malice against the truth, together with the present obstinate unbelief of your hearts, and show that these are the reasons why I say you will die in your sins. Drop the mic. <laughs> right? Right? But Jesus says, look at, I speak to the world those things which I heard from him, which I heard from my father. So Jesus emphasized the point once again that his words were from who? God the Father. They're from God the Father. Therefore, therefore, if the Pharisees oppose Jesus, they were really opposing God the Father. So Jesus now tells of his dependence on God the Father uh, for everything, everything. He says in verses 28 through 30, Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he, you guys, underline this. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Here are the Pharisees just pounding and pummeling him and trying to catch him and trap him and everything. Everybody else is listening, huge throngs of people. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Na 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 boo boo, right? How great is that, right? That he goes forth, his word goes forth, his word goes forth, right? And so he says, look at when you lift up the Son of Man, the lifting up Jesus described has nothing to do with exalting Jesus in ways that we normally think. Not like he's going to receive applause or that, you know, he, you know that, that, that he's a celebrity. It has to do with lifting up Jesus onto the what? Onto the cross. That's right. Lifting up off the ground as he's on the cross. That's what he's talking about. Lifting up Jesus off the ground on the cross. And when Jesus was crucified, they would see the perfect obedience of the Son to the Father. They would see that truly, I do nothing of myself. Doing the will of the Father. Doing the will of the Father. I'm dying for your sin. See, his lifting up on the cross would be his vindication. Right? It would be his vindication. Then it would be manifested that he had acted and spoken throughout with his father's authority. Here's my vindication. I'm doing the will of the father. I'm doing everything to please him. I don't speak unless he tells me to. And he says, look, at the Father hasn't left me alone. He hasn't left me alone. See, the unity between the Father and the Son continued, and it will always continue. It will always continue. Despite the accusations of the Pharisees, Jesus was as close to the Father as ever, and he still is. He says, I always, always, always do th everything to please him. He can say always because he's God, you know because he's without sin. See, Jesus was bold enough to say those words to his adversaries. I mean, he was essentially challenging those enemies, right, uh, on something that he did or does not, that they didn't like, but he was always, always pleasing the Father. You may not like it, but I'm here to please my Father. I'm here to please my father. And you know what happens? Then the enemies go silent. They go silent. 
I mean, this was a remarkable testimony to the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. I always please my Father. I always, always do those things that please him. It's easy to say I always do the will of the Father when you want to debate theological points. However, it's another thing to always do the will of the Father when it means going to the cross. But for the glory set before him, he endured the cross. The cross would be the perfect obedience of Jesus. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. When the Pharisees heard Jesus speak, they became more opposed to him, right? They became more opposed to him. Yet there were many, many that heard the same words, and they believed him. <laughs> and they believed him. They believed despite the evident opposition of their religious leaders. Conviction. Living word. Speak, Lord, for I'm listening. They knew it was truth. Light. Living water. Living bread. So, in verses 31 and 32 now, Jesus offers discipleship and freedom to those believing in him. So, let's actually read verses 30 through 47. Yes. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the Son, capital S, sets you free, you really will be free. I know you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word is not welcome among you. I speak what I have seen in the presence of the Father. Therefore, you do what you have heard from your father. Our father is Abraham, they replied. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus told them, you would do what Abraham did. But now you're trying to kill me a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You're doing what your father says. We weren't born of sexual immorality, they said. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies and the father of liars. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I tell the truth, why don't you believe me? The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen, because you are not from God. Hmm. So now Jesus is offering freedom, discipleship, to those who are believing in him. Now remember, he just said many were believing in him, right? And so Jesus said to those Jews now who believed in him, okay, that that's the beginning of belief. That's the beginning. That's the starting point. Like your salvation, that's the starting point. That's the starting point. Now you need to continue in belief. And that's what he's telling them. Okay? In other words, this section of this discourse, of this teaching, he's teaching is um, to those who believe. To those who believe. And yet... They need to continue to believe. Are you following me? You come to Christ, and you accept what he did on the cross for you. That's the start of belief. Now you need to walk in it. Now you need to walk in that belief. Okay? He says, if you abide in my word, 
you are my disciples indeed. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So if we will be Jesus' disciples, we must abide in his word. Right? A disciple just means that you're a follower, that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, okay? There is no other way. To be a follower, the word made, a follower of Jesus, meaning Jesus, who's the word made flesh, is to abide. It's to live in. It's to dwell in. It's to make your home in his word. In his word. If you abide in my word. Remember, he's emphasizing to those who have heard now, amidst all the Pharisees, blah, 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 and all the others who have believed, okay? They had believed. Now he tells them, you need to keep on believing. To be a disciple, you need to abide in my word. In other words, it's not just the golden ticket to heaven. You need to abide in my word. You've made the first step towards faith, and obedience, and now you need to keep walking. Now you need to keep walking. You need to abide in my word. And then he says, then you really are my disciples. Then you really are my disciples. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. Abide in his word means this, welcoming it, being at home with it, and living with it so continuously that it becomes part of the believer's life a permanent influence and stimulus in every fresh advance in goodness and holiness. Isn't that great? Welcoming it, being at home with it, living with it, so continuously that it becomes part of your life, a permanent influence and stimulus in every fresh advance in goodness and holiness. That's why we're always talking about our non-negotiable face-to-face time with Jesus, right? Right? Right, you need to abide, abide in his word, right? And this too is another statement reflecting what? Reflecting the unity between the Father and the Son. Jesus called people to abide in his word and in the mouth of anyone other than Jesus, those words would be absurd. Those would be absurd other than in his words. And he says, and when you do that, you shall know the truth and then what does the truth do? sets you free. The truth sets you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth sets you free. See, this is the result of the abiding, of abiding, I should say, in the word of Jesus. So we prove that we are disciples, and we prove that we know the truth. And then what happens is God works his freedom in our life through his truth. Are you following me? God's the one that's working his freedom in our lives as we know the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the freedom that Jesus spoke of doesn't come from just an academic pursuit of truth in general but from abiding in his word and being his disciple. That's how you're made free. That's how you're made free. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. There is nothing like the freedom we can have in Jesus. There should have been a big amen there. Okay, I'll give you another chance. Okay, ready? There is nothing like the freedom we can have in Jesus. There you go. Excellent. No money can buy it, no status can obtain it, no works can earn it, and nothing can match it. It is tragic that not every Christian experiences this freedom, which can never be found except by abiding in God's word and being Jesus' disciple. That means that You've crossed the line. You've accepted him as, his, as the Savior, as your Savior, your personal Savior, who died and lives for you. Your past, present, and future sin is forgiven, and you want to follow him the rest of your life and please him. And so we have the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. That's his word. That's living and active, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, right? 
living and active, and we want to become more and more like him, so we soak in his word. We soak, not to become smarter sinners, but to know him more, to walk intimately with him, to draw close to him, and he draws near to us. Being his disciple. Knowing the truth. And then in the midst of all the darkness of the world, the truth sets you free. That's where you're able to walk, right? On that highway of holiness we learned in Isaiah. We're here. Because we're free in him. Because the truth sets us free. And so... Jesus answers their protests that they are already free, right? So he says, okay, this is how you're free. And, and he, you know, they're like, we're Abraham's descendants. We're Abraham. And, and, and we've never been in bondage to anyone. Really? <laughs> really? Okay, let's go back a little bit, okay? So the reaction of the religious leaders wasn't, wow, that's wonderful. That's how we can be set free? Oh, that's, no, 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 that's not. They're like, um, mm -mm. we don't need this. We're good. We're good. Ever been there? I was there. I was there, right? So when you think about that, that is like a, a really um, an unthinking statement on their part because the Jewish people had been in bondage under Egypt and the Philistines, under Babylon, under Persia, under Syria, and under Rome. And they were still under Roman's oppression. Oh, but we're free. But we're free, right? Okay. So Jesus says, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So he, he takes them back. Let, let's go this way now, right? So whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So sin in the passage of this uh, scripture is a verb, tense, indicating habitual, continual action. Action. Habitual, continual action. Continually living a life of sin. So when you do that, then you are what? You're a slave of sin. You're a slave of sin. So he says, look at a slave doesn't abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. So slavery to sin is the worst kind of slavery because there's no escape from ourself, Right? Okay, a son, capital S, must set us free. Because he said we were dead in our trespasses and sin. And a dead person can do nothing. So the son needs to set us free. And the son of God sets us free and brings us into the family of God. Brings us into the household of God, okay? So the slave has no permanent footing in the house, right? He may be dismissed or he may be sold, but not a son, right? Right? not a daughter. If the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. If the son, capital S, meaning Jesus, right? If we're set free from our slavery to sin, set free by the son and set free by abiding in Jesus's word and being his disciple, then we're free indeed. We have a true freedom that contrasts to the freedom the Pharisees very blindly claimed about being Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage. No, see, the sun makes you free. Charles Spurgeon said this, so the slave of sin cannot by himself change his status. He cannot convert himself, nor can he be converted by any fellow sinner. The liberator from our bondage must come from outside the ranks of enslaved humanity. And that's Jesus the Son of God. See, the point is clear. Freedom does not consist in the word freedom or in the words, but in relationship to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Through his abiding word, becoming his disciple. So, <laughs> they prove themselves to be unlike Abraham, quote unquote, you know, their father, okay? And so in verses 37 through 41 that we read, 
Um, Jesus says, you know, I know you're Abraham's descendants. Now, Jesus would admit they're Abraham's descendants in a genetic sense, right? In a genetic sense, okay? But Abraham was not their father in a spiritual sense. When messengers came from heaven, right, to Abraham, he received them. In Genesis 18, remember, they came to the tent and to tell him he'd have a child in his old age. But these genetic descendants of Abraham rejected and sought to kill the one, meaning Jesus, sent from heaven. And he says, look, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, uh, but my word has no place in you. Their rejection of the word of Jesus and Jesus the word proved that they what? That they were not like Abraham. They didn't have the freedom that comes from abiding in his word. And when I was reading uh, uh, some portions of, of uh, Spurgeon's sermon, he looked at several ways that God's word should have a place in each of us as a believer. He said the word of God ought to have an inward place. The word of God ought to have a place of honor in our life. The word of God ought to have a place of trust that he said it, we believe it, and that settles it. The word of God ought to have a place of rule that we're obedient to his word. The word of God ought to have a place of love because God is love. And the word of God ought to have a permanent place in us as a believer. That means that we desire to be in his word. Not just under his word, which is great, but to be in his word for ourselves. And he says uh, to, the, to the believers, he says, look it, I speak what I have seen with my father. And he reminded, look at, I'm continually consistent with my father. And what they did was consistent with their father. He said, you do what you have seen with your father. And then Jesus would very, very clearly tell them very soon who their father was. And of course, they jumped on the bandwagon of, well, Abraham is our father. Abraham is our father. Okay, so the religious leaders were protesting that Abraham was their true father. Once again, true in a genetic sense, but not in a spiritual sense. Jesus agreed that they were their descendants of Abraham, but not children of Abraham because they sought to kill Jesus. They sought to kill him, okay? When Abraham did what? Abraham embraced him. So therefore, Jesus said, you're doing the deeds of your father. And that's not Abraham. So Jesus was exposing their inconsistency in their life. They said they were children of Abraham, but they didn't act like it at all. Not at all. And Jesus' point was really important. Our spiritual parentage is what determines our nature and our destiny. Right? Our spiritual parentage, who's our father, determines our nature, how we walk, how we talk, and our destiny. See, if we're born again, remember we talk about Nicodemus, right? If we're born again, we know Jesus as our Savior, right? And we have God as our Father. What's happening is it will show in our nature, in our walk and talk here, and it will show in our destiny. Because we're going to be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. But if our Father, small f, okay, is Satan or Adam, it will also show in our nature, our walk and our talk, in our destiny. Just as it shows in these adversaries of Jesus in this story, in John 8. 
So the religious leaders, again, were questioning the, the parentage of Jesus, okay? In other words, he was like, they said to him, uh, this is in the New King James, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to him, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. So in other words, they're saying, we're not born of fornication. So they're, they're once again insulting the parentage of Jesus, okay, calling him basically an illegitimate child, that they weren't believing that he was virgin born, okay? In other words, we're not born of fornication, uh, but we don't know about you, Jesus, See, Jesus looks at him and says, you know, but if God was your father, you would love me. You wouldn't be saying these things. You would love me. He, he once again makes this remarkable claim, I'm deity. I am so close to my father in nature, in who I am as God. I'm claiming deity here. And, and there's no room for you to say, I love God, but reject me. There's no room for that. If you love God, you love me. Because I'm, I'm God in the flesh. He says, for I proceeded forth and I came from God. So here Jesus is describing the unity of nature and purpose and will with God the Father. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. So long as the Jews thought there was but one person in the Godhead, it was impossible for them to believe aright in our Lord. Hence his insistence to their theologians that he has a father, that he is not the father, but that he is the son, that the son, though he is not the father, is for all that God. See, because it's the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. And he looks at him and he says, why don't you understand my speech? And he, then he answers it basically. He says, because you know why? Because you're unable to listen to my word. You're unable to listen to my word. He explained that the problem with their lack of understanding was what? Rooted in their failure, their inability to listen to his word. Remember, all kinds of people on the outside, they were listening to his word, right? And they were believing. But they were not. They were not. So Jesus reveals himself as the true identity of their true father. And he says, and I know who your father is. It's the devil. It's the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. So the religious leaders are doing what? They brought up the issue of parentage by insulting Jesus, right? And Jesus replied by explaining their spiritual heritage, parentage, right? You are spiritual children of the devil. It was evident. It was evident in, they, in their desires. Their desires matched the, matched the devil's desires, right? The desire to kill. The desire to deceive. That's who your father is. He says, look at the devil was a murderer from the beginning. It was the introduction of death through the first sin. When, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, right? Jesus gives us some insight into the character of Satan here, right? The lie is core to the devil's character. He can't do anything else but lie. So when you hear lies, that is not from Jesus, you know. When you hear oh, you can't, oh, you won't, oh, you'll never be able, that is not from Jesus. That is from the pit of hell. That is from the devil going, mm, 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 mm. those are all lies. When you hear lies, you know that you know that they're from Satan because he's the father of lies. That's all he can do is lie. And he's a deceiver. He's a deceiver, most dangerous of all. He's a deceiver who deceived himself. And Jesus says, but because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. You rejected me because I tell you the truth that you don't want to hear. It was not that I'm speaking lies to you. You're believing the lies of your father, the devil. And it's the same with us today. 
It's because you're believing the lies that you hear from the devil and you don't want to believe the truth because the truth will set you free. That's not what Satan wants for you. He wants to keep you under oppression. He wants to keep you in the scheming and who he is and the lies and the deception and everything. And Jesus is like, nope, 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 nope. I'll break all that. Just like this. Just like this. He says, which of you convicts me of sin? Again, Jesus gave his enemies who hated him so badly and wanted to kill him an opportunity to say, is there some sin in me? Do you see some sin in me? And they could not. They could not. This is another remarkable testimony of the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Remember when he went to the cross, perfectly without sin, and he became sin for us. No sin in him. Sin was placed on him for us. Past, present, and future. And he tells him, look, you don't hear. You don't hear because you're not of God. And so Jesus pressed home the point of spiritual parentage once again, which was evident by your actions, notably the rejection of me as Jesus Christ and my word. So what do they do? They call him names then. They tell him that he's demon-possessed. You can't possibly be. That's not who you are. Let's read to the end. The Jews responded to him, aren't, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? Remember, Samaritans were less than less of people, right? I do not have a demon, Jesus answered. On the contrary, I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my glory. The one who seeks it also judges. I assure you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death, ever. Then the Jews said, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and so did the prophets. You say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death, ever. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Even the prophets died. Who do you pretend to be? If I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My father, you say about him, he is our God. He is the one who glorifies me. You've never known him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. The Jews replied, you aren't even 50 years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, I assure you, before Abraham was, what did he say? I am. At that, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple complex. Right? In closing, they were still trying to get him and get him and get him and get him and get him. And he just continued to tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. And even when they said, well, what about Abraham? Well, of course he knew that. He was always in past eternity, right? And he's always in now and he's in future eternity. And he proclaims deity. I am. I am. I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. That made them crazy. Because he's proclaiming once again that he is deity. Jesus equals God. And so what were they going to do? Kill him. And what did Jesus do? Bye-bye now. Right? Right? Just, whoosh, just left. Perhaps he left miraculously, or perhaps he just sauntered out through the people. We don't know. But what I want you to understand in this passage is that it's just not, it's great to have the starting point of salvation, but to actually know him and to be his disciple you need to follow hard after him. And you need to abide in his word. And then guess what? You change. Right? Your thoughts change. Your actions change. And you become more and more like him and less like your putrid self and mine as well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are God. 
and that we are not. You know, I praise you for that. I praise you for that. And I am so grateful. So grateful. That you walked and talked and showed us who you were on this earth through the gospels. And then went to the cross for us. And then the cross was lifted up. And then we are set free by that truth. Help us to know that this week. Help us to live it this week. As a disciple of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Next week we're going to be in chapter 9. And it's about healing a man that was born blind. Okay, so I want you to read ahead in, in chapter 9. Um, and I love this one because, it, you know, they keep bugging him like, well, well, you know, what do you mean? What do you mean? You're he goes, all I know is once I was blind and now I can see. Isn't that so great? All right. Have a great week, ladies.